Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, April 4th. Let's see who's first here. Engineering. All the way down to engineering. Okay, uh, today we have three uh, project calendars on the agenda for uh, consideration by council. Uh, these three uh, project calendars have to do with uh, annual programs that we do. We have prepared plans and are ready to proceed to letting. Uh, the first of those projects is our sanitary sewer slip lining project. As uh, you can see, these are the locations. Uh, there's actually 14 smaller locations within this map. Uh, that we will be slip lining uh, sanitary sewers in these neighborhoods. Uh, it's a little over 6,000 square f or 6,000 lineal feet of pipe, uh, ranging from about 8 inch up to 15 inch. Uh, it's estimated at $243,839. We do have uh, budgeted within the budget and the CIP uh, approximately $300,000 to do slip lining and manhole repairs. Um, within our annual program. We are uh, w wishing to go forward with a uh, public bid on April 25th and uh, are expect expecting the completion of the project to be September 24th. We would allow the contractor to start any time prior to that. I'm oh, sorry, what did you say the cost was on that? Uh, 243839 Okay. That's our estimate. We would hope that it would come in lower than that. But that's within the budgeted amount. Yes, the 300000 is for the two programs. The other one is actually coming up uh, as the third one, so we'll talk about that too. Okay, any questions on that one? Oh, they did my street last year. It was pretty slick. Pardon? They did my street last year, the slip line, and it was oh. pretty slick. It was yeah, it's a good process. It yeah. uh, keeps us from having to excavate the lines, and uh, we don't see a a decrease in capacity and cuts back on our I and I, which uh, improves our system and our uh, effluent. So yeah, I think we had one one day where the morning we weren't supposed to use Flush. the water. <laughs> yeah, that was it. So it was pretty slick. Yeah, it's a neat process. They go in and uh, slip in the material. Uh, between the time the materials in there is heated and then cures to the time where they can run the machine in and cut in the services. That's the time you cannot flush. However, uh, that only takes three or four hours. So, good process. Mm -hmm. Second program for the year is our annual HMA overlay uh, program. This is our asphalt overlay program. Uh, we do have in this location, we have 10 locations that we have evaluated the entire system, um, which we do annually and looked at those that were both uh, high in need and uh, some that are in higher in volume. So we kind of spread that around into areas that takes in traffic need and the condition of the, of the service that's there now. So these are the uh, 10 locations. We are looking at about 5,000 tons of asphalt this year at a cost of about $751,170.25. Once again, we have a budget in the CIP. In the, in the budget and the CIP, we have about $750,000 approved for this project. We expect it to come in below that amount, so we expect to be within budget at the time of letting. That letting will occur also on April 25th, and we expect this to be completed by July 17th. So this will be bid? Yes. Third project is the smaller of the three. This is our sanitary sewer manhole um, pro project. Uh, within this is part of that $300,000 that we get for our sanitary sewer improvements. Uh, we do have four locations. Uh, we do estimate the cost to be around $52,990. This puts us slightly over that $300,000, but we expect that the in the end we will be, low the, be below the budgeted amount. We also will bid this on April 25th, and we'll have it completed within 25 working days. Okay, questions? Okay. Thank okay, thanks, Dan.
Good afternoon. The first item under uh, planning is item number three, and this is uh, a waiver of the subdivision regs to allow uh, uh, Mr. Sebney, I don't know if you know his, how you pronounce his name, uh, the septic tank system waiver, oh. Sebney, um, uh, allow uh, Mr. Sebney to hook on to a septic system opposed to uh, our sanitary sewer. And I think this is a, <coughs> a project that we just wanted to kind of highlight for the city council. And as you, as you recall, coming south on 10th Street, this is Williams Drive. This area, and you can see where the lots are much larger than these lots. This is the area that we annexed. It was a county subdivision, so that all the lots are about an acre or two acres, one or two acres out there. Um, developed in the county, all on septics. And if you remember when we brought everyone in, the big conversation was, well, as soon as you get in, you're going to bring sewer up and we're going to have to pay all this money for this, this sewer. Well, this is an example of, you know, per the agreement, you know, we're not, we're not doing that. We're going to allow someone to split their property and go on to a septic uh, for uh, one reason is they have enough ground to do so. Two, we don't have sewer out in that area, so it wouldn't make any sense for the city to extend the sewer to that home to provide for that. Um, so I think it's just uh, good to understand why we're allowing the waiver, some of the background on it. If someone came in tomorrow and wanted to develop a piece of property in the city of Marion, and build septics, we would have a pretty big problem with that. They couldn't. They couldn't hook up to city sewer if they wanted to. Correct. At this point. It, at this this one, no. There's huh? no. But we no also are not limiting there. the development of the property at this point because um, they are in the city and they have the. Now, one key element to this is so that when they signed on for the annexation, if they split their property, they will lose that transition of taxes. If you recall. Um, we did a 10-year sliding scale transition of their taxes from the county to the, uh, with the city taxes. So that transition will go away and the property owner that currently lives out there that's splitting the property will lose that transition and they'll, they'll come on to the full tax rolls. So, And as will the new lot, they won't have any transition. So um, we just wanted to bring that to the council's attention, let you know uh, kind of what's going on out there. I don't see this happening in many other places. If you look at the lots, they just don't set up well for a split. Um, we would, but I also just want to caution the council. We wouldn't do this if someone came in on a bare piece of ground, even if it's in the city. We would, re and they wanted to develop it. We would require that they bring the sewer to it. That's the only way we get sewer through new development. This is mm -hmm. an existing lot. It's in a county subdivision. We're a little more uh, flexed on this end of it. So. Where is the closest sewer pump? Um, yeah. Right there. Right there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the orange line, yeah. Yeah, there may be sewer closer up <laughs> north of Connection. I, I, I'm just thinking of the future. Are we going to be able to service that area with sewers at all? Absolutely. We looked at that at annexation on the ability to serve all this area, and we can. Yeah. It's just a matter of running for uh, main sewer main up to that location. There's a sewer stub here, but I don't. That kind of peaked out, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, that goes to about over there and stops. Yeah. So. But anyway, any questions on that? Uh, the next item is item number four, <clears throat> and as uh, required as part of the interim development ordinance, the city council is to review uh, major improvements in the uh, uh, in the central corridor. Um, this one happens to be also in the uptown district and the commercial historic district. So this facade has been reviewed by the Historic Preservation Commission. The Uptown Main Street Design Committee and the Planning Commission and now to the City Council. Um, this is the what was previously, and I think a lot of people still refer to it as the old Sorg building. Uh, uh, Clayton Parks is operating the orthodontic clinic in that building currently. Uh, the project uh, was brought forward originally just to do half the facade. Um, they applied for uh, TIF financing and uh, um, 
which the council supported. Uh, and upon doing that, they actually are gonna do a full renovation of the entire facade, which I think is pretty exciting. If you'll recall, um, the stone work on the uh, eastern portion was done and there was a lot of discussion about whether that was uh, historically um, representative of the district. Um, there wasn't anything in place to really cause them to do something different. But in this uh, facade improvement, they're going to basically do everything from the middle uh, freeze board south, south down, and they'll redo the whole facade. Um, and try to bring that more historically accurate with the with the original building. This is an original uh, picture of the building. So they're going to do the, the corner. This will be stone, or I'm not stone. Sorry, this will be brickwork. And they are working on uh, potentially bringing a uh, more detailed cornice, or I'm sorry, freeze board across the front as well to kind of separate the uses, uh, to separate the building facade. So this is a really good example of how the IDO works. You guys get to review the, the plans, the Planning Commission, uh, the Historic Preservation Commission uh, also get to review it for consistency with uh, what they like to see as well. So we're excited about this project. Any the, questions? The doors are staying recessed in. Is um, that the, looks yeah, like it. Yeah, yes, they will. That, that wasn't original, but right. to meet ADA, I think they're uh, kind of required to do that. So the original uh, cornice work on the top will remain and, and everything um, from here up will be the same. So they did work with us on that. Uh, we, when we first met with them, we asked them to go back and take a look at options um, for a, the whole facade. They did, some, they did some due diligence. They looked back behind some of the walls. They broke some pieces out. If you look up, you can see where they did that and came back with a revised project, which I think everybody's pretty excited about. Any questions? Uh, Tom, on the uh, alley side, the east elevation, uh, are those windows blocked up now? You see the brick over windows? Oh. There. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, can't. I believe they are. They are now? Okay. Yeah. I believe those are blocked up. The east end of the building will remain generally unchanged for repairs as needed. That's what they're saying. And then the back, they're, they're going to paint the back to, to kind of, I don't think they want to do the same color, but they want to do an offset that kind of blends in with the other painting that occurred on the, uh, on the building to the west. So there's some cohesion there. It's going to be a real improvement to the front. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a great, great project. Um, I don't necessarily want to talk about five, six, and seven unless the council does, but I just wanted to point out that they were setting the date for three public hearings. Two are just alley vacations. Um, the one I would just highlight here um, is number six, and this is the vacation of Indian Creek Road consistent with the preliminary plat. That'll be a big deal. There'll be folks here to talk about it. Uh, the, the concept isn't that we vacate it and two weeks from now, close it. We just want to vacate it. We'll also want to get an easement in place as soon as possible. That way we don't have to start the process of vacation when we do need to have that uh, facility closed. So, uh, can, you, can you tell me, Tom, is Tower Terrace going to be done soon? So if we do vacate it, we can get out to the, by around the uh, you know, roundabout out to 35th? Yeah. I don't know, if Dan, if you want to. You know, I mean, I think that's a necessity before we ever close. Constru construction plans are probably about 80% done uh, for Tower Terrace. <coughs> uh, we've split it into two projects, so the realignment, the improvements to Winslow Road south of the Tower Terrace location will be done separately. I didn't really bring any of that with me. Um, we're waiting now on the developer's agreement to be approved. Beyond that, we can go right straight to construction and have it done by the end of the year, by the end of the season. We do not intend to close any creek road until after Tower Terrace is available for use. Right. That, that old gravel road is terrible. Yeah. Worst road in the world, you know. 
We would not do that. Okay. But we're just trying to get some of the formalities out of the way um, with um, Indy Creek Road. This is a vacation for the west half, not the east half, which is part of the preliminary plat. Um, so, no, we're trying to pull it all together at the same time. Morris Woods wouldn't consider selling Indian Creek Road to the city of Merriam, would they? I don't think they would at this point. Pardon me? I don't think they would at this point because they have lots platted there. Yeah, it's part of its preliminary plat. The back half of those lots include the, the oh, I know. easement. So, Are we going to be able to keep a trail? We're keeping right away back there. Yes. Yep. The intent is to use the west half of the right away for trail. So because Brookside was a subdivision. They signed the houses on Brookside. Yes, yeah, yeah, because it was a subdivision, they went to the center line um, and the uh, they dedicated right away with the plat. So the west half is actually, so the west 33 feet would be C City of Marion right away. The east half was never <coughs> dedicated with a plat because it was never platted for development prior to now. So. Um, it was county easement. Yeah. So, so we'll still have. I don't know if the is it 33. It's 33 or 40. I'm not sure. Yeah. Where. So we still have a significant. But I mean, if we do this and turn, what assurance are we going to have that that road's going to stay open until we get Tower Terrace done out to the roundabout? And when we do the uh, action to actually vacate it on the same agenda, we'll have an easement right away easement prepared, so that the easement. Um, would be required in, until such time that we start the construction so that we have assurances that we can keep the road open. So. Well, we're going to have Winslow tore up, <laughs> and if we Indian Creek were to disappear, the, you've got 4,000 residents that couldn't get home unless they go out to County Home Road and in that way. Yeah. Yeah, we also have a subdivision going on the north end of Winslow as well. Yeah, uh, timing being everything. <laughs> we're trying to uh, work around that uh, problem, I guess. We'll put it that way. Right. And at the next at next council meeting, we'll have drawings and illustrations and a lot more. I just wanted you guys to kind of be prepared for <laughs> that. Even at hitting the agenda, I'm sure you'll get some phone calls. So, um, Can you talk about 10 briefly? Uh, item number 10 is the uh, right-of-way acquisition for Winslow Road. So because that property isn't platted, so we're not platting the property around the road, we want to do the acquisition plat to actually obtain the right-of-way um, for, the, for the road that's constructed. Um, I believe there's, is there an easement on it now, Dan? Do you know? Yeah, I think there's a construction easement there. Uh, we want to have the right-of-way in place so we can open it up when Tower Terrace opens up once the fence is in. Um, it, this portion is completed, except for a little bit of signage. Um, but it, we want to make sure the right-of-way is there so we, the public can use it. Most of the time when we Pardon? do roads, it's, <laughs> it's consistent with a, a plat, a final plat. Yeah. Um, this, we got this one out ahead of time. It's very similar to Irish Drive. We did the same thing with Irish Drive. Yeah, this this would have evolved as each final plat final plat adjacent to it was final platted each parcel, and we don't want to wait for that to happen. So we're doing it all at once. And you'll see, uh, you know, as you recall, we did the right away for Tower Terrace Road through the Linmar campus on I think March 3rd, as well. Um, there was an acquisition plat, so we're slowly getting all the pieces together um, for the road. So. What's what's the status on that? fence and all that uh, I'm pretty sure the material has been delivered because it's eight foot fence it uh, was a special order uh, they're just waiting now for the weather to so it's not so muddy just I think they'll be a, they had hoped to be out there in the middle of March but the weather didn't cooperate so hopefully it'll be soon um, number 11 I don't know that it was started in your agenda but I thought I'd, I'd, I would bring it uh, forward to the City Council um, this is a relocation of DNR Engines, who's currently um, was in the building next to Cleaner Paint. It's in the corridor. Um, we need to acquire it for uh, the Central Corridor project. 
in particular the next phase, which would be the roundabout. Um, we are, uh, because of that, we need to provide relocation assistance uh, to DNR. Um, they are moving to Marion. We made that a requirement. On, on, yeah, I was over talking to the people and they said they're going to 20, 2500 block of 5th Avenue? Correct, yep. Yeah. Um, Randy, I think, is in the audience this yeah. evening. Um, so we've been working with him. I, I, I think this is, you guys got quite a packet on this, and I, I just want you to see, we get, this is what we require when we start doing these, estimates. there's three estimates for all of the assistance and a lot of work on their behalf to do this. And um, so what we will do is we'll authorize uh, the payment and then we will uh, re repay upon invoice. So everybody uh, uh, understands how that works. Um, but I just wanted to bring that to light. The next item, number 12, um, just want to have a brief, last week we talked about the Lucor Road project, I think at great length, um, redoing Lucor east of Hunter's Ridge. Um, one of the things that uh, we're going to be working through on that project um, is going to be uh, sidewalk construction. I think you've seen we were doing a whole new uh, alignment or a whole new road. We were going to put sidewalks on both sides. Um, as we discuss a lot, it seems like, over the last few years, um, when we do a final plat, it's required that sidewalks go in with the improvement um, of the property or, or at such time the city council passes a resolution <coughs> of necessity. Um, the area out here between Hunter's Ridge Road and the bridge, there's limited numbers of sidewalks out there, but a lot of the property has been platted. Um, what we are uh, uh, asking is that, or I guess we're presenting it as an option to the city council. What we've figured out is that uh, basically all the homeowners associations and Hunter's Ridge would be on the hook for the sidewalks, a portion of the sidewalks out here. And so that would uh, um, result in them having to pay for those. So it's about $65,000 total for all of the folks that are out there. And their you, portion of it or the, or the total their, cost? Their, their portion their of it portion. would be about $65,000. The, um, uh, what we're proposing is that we would be, we would construct it, construct it with the project and then approach uh, everyone that's involved in this with a voluntary assessment agreement saying that they would pay for the project voluntarily um, over a period of time consistent with our assessment project and proceedings. Um, we have a feeling that not everybody's going to be really excited about this concept, um, but this is, this is how we get sidewalks constructed in areas. Um, I don't know that we want to, I know it's a 1.3, $1.5 million project, so $65,000 just seems like a small portion of that, but it is an obligation that uh, every homeowner who's built a house in Marion had to do. They had to put their sidewalk in. So um, veering from that would be, I think, a little difficult um, to justify. However, that's the question to council. <coughs> They're on the hook for it. The memorandum of understandings at <coughs> the time of the final plats are requiring this to be done. So we would, uh, that's how we would plan to approach this, but we just want the council to be aware of, of this situation. So they they're aware that that situation is such that they are, will owe that. We will, we do not want to make them aware of it until the council has directed us to proceed <laughs> in a certain direction. So I think what she means is they. Uh, they understand that that, 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 that is an they've, obligation. They've had the understanding that, that this could happen. They, they absolutely should have that understanding. I would. Was I would that in that small that. print? It's been of record. It's a part of their final plat. So I'm okay. But we why, do why plan to approach the homeowners association. A lot of these, uh, every one of them is a homeowners association except for Hunters Ridge. So we would have a sit down conversation with them and explain the process so they understand what we're talking about. The option they would have, you know, if that option, if the council would like to proceed is that, you know, you can put it in yourself too, just like we do on the assessment program. However, it's generally not cheaper and w the way that we're figuring the cost is definitely to their advantage to let us just get it all done and and pay their proportionate fee, so. So why weren't they put in at the time of the plat, or? We never require sidewalks to go in with the final plat. 
unless there's some overwhelming need. Uh, if it's along a collector street, we, we sometimes do. But that's why when you buy a lot, your sidewalk's not in. It generally goes in with the construction of the house. That's why we got the gap problem that we're trying to resolve. So if I could jump in. Uh, this was a kind of a semi-rural cross-section out here, and there's a lot of, were a lot of ditches. So it was difficult at the time to put those sidewalks in. So that was part of the reason. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason was that the city agreed to allow the, them to pass on it until such time as Lucar Road is reconstructed. That's where we're at now, and that's what's kind of kicking this all forward. Mm -hmm. um, but as you look out there, there's drive it. There's a lot of rural cross section there, so it would have been difficult. We're going to clean that all up and urbanize it with the reconstruction. I can attest that after 20 years in a condo on Lucar Road, that neither my abstract nor my condo agreement says anything about a sidewalk mm. on Lucar Road. We also have a uh, pretty good drainage ditch across the front of our property. Mm -hmm. What will happen with that? It's rocked in uh, with the permission of the city of Marion. And uh, would the golf course be running a sidewalk to the bridge? Uh, the, the sidewalk goes the length of the project. Uh, there will be That's sidewalk on the west side and uh, trail on the east side. The, the ditch the ditch you're talking about will go away. We'll, we'll put the storm sewer in and replace that. With storm east sewer. side is in the county. A uh, small portion of it is. Uh, we're, we're providing that. It's more or less, it's, it's in the county, but it's more or less city maintenance and city responsibility. So we're recommending, when we bring the project calendar forward, we'll show you all this. Um, we can council at that time can wish to pursue participation by the county if they wish, but we'd like to probably just go ahead with the project and do it as a city project. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, as an example, I mean, it, if you think about the cost to fill that all in and to redo that whole area, that you, you live out there, so you know what I'm uh, talk about. But it was put in mm -hmm. by city recommendation for drainage. Correct. You know, we had nothing. We didn't make any decisions on that. Correct. Correct. So that I mean, the city has to correct that problem, right? Yeah, 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 we will take care of that. I think it was actually put in based on the, the yeah. Hunter's Ridge engineer recommended that. But, but the sidewalk, is it going to continue then? On the other side of the bridge? No, it will be only be a local okay. portion of the trail and sidewalk. So it's a sidewalk to nowhere. It will connect actually up to Silver Oak and to Hunter's Ridge. So all the traffic, all the area on Lucor can use all the sidewalk system within Hunter's, Hunter's Ridge. And go all the way down Winslow, all the way over to the school. All over, it's connected on the west end all the way to the high school. But as an example, and I, this is what I was getting to, is that the cost to fill in and do all of that work would be substantial. And I think the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but when the, the cost is figured for the sidewalk, it's for the sidewalk. Yeah, staff is recommending that we follow our policy, which we do with sidewalk assessment projects. And that is that we only charge for the sidewalk itself, the four inch thick, four foot wide sidewalk. We are not not recommending that we charge for retaining walls, grading, seating, anything associated with that. So that cost could easily, if they do it themselves, would be quite probably twice this amount. So we're, we're trying to work with them per our normal policies and process. You're not president this year, are you? <laughs> well, I won't. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's... It, I mean, it, it, we, we understand that there's dollars involved, and that's why we're bringing it to the council. We don't want you guys to all of a sudden get word of, of this, so that's why we're bringing it. I, as an example, um, and it's probably would be, you know, we've got um, Hunter's Ridge is on the hook uh, per the estimates for $14,300. Uh, fairways, you're at about 9000 
uh, Vin, uh, Vintage Condo, which I think are the ones on the west side, just north of uh, Silver Oak, are, are 5,700. Uh, Broadstone, I don't know which one that is. Is that Stone Court? Or for 2,600. Um, Camden Farms has got one segment that's uh, about 11,000 and one, one segment that's a little over five. So that's kind of the breakdown. Wouldn't it be a good time to annex that county property into the city of Marion? Across the creek behind it is voluntarily annexed. Down in here? Uh, up by, yeah, by the bridge there. Oh. I don't know if we, I don't even know if we'd have enough voluntary to create it. Well, across, we tried to do that. Across the creek, we, the uh, Pantini's uh, came into the city, as I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, that'd be across the creek from them. Dan, do you know which one? Uh, no, not exactly. It's one of those. They came in as part of the Brookside yeah, annexation. Right there, so. I think. Yeah, we try and we, we tried. We, if you recall, uh, this house is still in the county, but we got everything else. What about across the street from that? Now yeah, that's county, so it's no the next house up. The old oh, <laughs> yeah, that's still in the county. <laughs> well, I mean. Eventually, yeah, you know the old, the old school on the corner of Indian Creek and Luke are there. Is that in the city or county? In the county. Carl Foster's old house. There's only three or four on the right in there that are actually in the, the city. On the right side of Luke are. Yeah, there's they they voluntarily came in as part of that annexation, um, hoping to eventually get sanitary sewer. I think. There'll be a need to get to get these folks in. We're going to need a pretty big voluntary. If you look at the map on that side, <coughs> we'll need a pretty big chunk to 80-20 to get some of those folks. Hey, you can see the boundary right there. Most of those folks came to the public hearing on the Indian Creek closure. <laughs> maybe, maybe you want to ask them. They're willing to annex. <laughs> well. If you remember, we had a meeting mm -hmm. at Hunter's Ridge Lodge, and that was primarily concerning closing in the creek. Yeah. yeah. In the, it ended up that way. Yeah. And I think the people understood that, and that's why I'm asking if we're yeah. going to have be able to, when we reach the, reach the end of Indian Creek, if we're going to be able to go out and around the roundabout and home. Yep. If not, you're going to have tons of traffic going through Lakeside or Brookside Drive there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, eventually, I don't know what's going to happen when uh, Tar Terrace becomes a thoroughfare through there. That's a whole different story than reaching the end of Indian Creek and going up around the roundabout in the end. But so they have digested that. Well, now we're going to, as bad as, in, as Glucor Road is, and it's a terrible road, and it is, uh, you know, uh, we, we do trying to keep trucks off of it now. We embargoed the bridge. And uh, I think that it's going to have to be well explained why, uh, even in my household, <laughs> why we need a sidewalk that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. And. Uh, well, there would just be a gap at this point from here to here because. Yeah, and it, that's it does another. Pick up. That's a big drainage area. Yeah. There. Ideally, we would be able to extend it, and but I don't even know if there's sidewalk capabilities across the bridge. I think there is. No, there's not. Yeah. We would have to widen the bridge for, and that's why we're stopping just north of the bridge. Is the bridge doesn't allow for that, for pedestrian crossing. We okay. are. I guess I'll add too that we are. Um, as soon as the Lucor plans are. A little farther along, we're planning on doing a neighborhood meeting out here and meeting with all, all the uh, people that are interested in talking to us about the Lucor project. We're just not quite that quite there yet. Thank you. So on Thursday, we would ask there be a motion directing staff to proceed with uh, uh, voluntary uh, assessment agreements related to the Lucor road project. So <coughs> and then we can report back on 
if we make it out alive, we will report back on that project, okay? So we'll do that on Thursday. Your Honor, I, I would like to uh, uh, inform the rest of the council about something which I've talked with Mr. Treharn about, and that is before any demolition is considered about the overpass of the railroad bridge to check the material that went into that overpass because uh, it's very possible that uh, it may be a little more costly to remove it than first anticipated. So it needs to, the, the material needs to be tested. That would be a question for engineering, correct? Or, or, or is it? The yeah, that's part of the process. We will, um, as directed by council, we will investigate the demolition, and that's what that process will do. Is to, uh, we will look at um, proceeding with some type of contract for uh, preparation of demolition. Uh, that'll come back to you for approval, of course. Uh, but also, we'll be getting some estimates on what that work will include and what will be involved with it. I'm not aware of any uh, bridges with asbestos in the concrete uh, in my 39 years of career. Is that, so is that the concern? That, well, in the 50s and 60s, it was very common to use asbestos with concrete because it did strengthen the concrete and the bonding of the asbestos fibers made it possible then for trains to maneuver across. and so. I have just heard that it's very probable that that is uh, That's something that will be. Yeah, we'll be looking process. at that. I know it was used in uh, sheetrock and in some homes in the 50s, but I was, I'm not aware of anything in concrete. So I will, we'll look into that though. Aha, uh -huh. see? Okay. Okay. Ready? Okay, the first item I wanted to bring to the council's attention was a, uh, the culmination of a couple of months worth of work that we've been working on with the uh, steering committee for Blue Zones. Um, Blue Zones started out, as you know, as a project that had support statewide through Wellmark and um, through Blue Cross and was sponsored as a program that ran through the end of 2016. And so the official support for that has, has stopped. Um, there's still a few things that we can continue to use. Um, the, cert the certification is good through the end of 2017, but a lot of our discussion has revolved around what are, what's the next steps. Um, as the council saw during the presentation from the last Gallup poll that was done, Marion has seen significant strides in the health of our community, um, largely due to these blue zone activities. So uh, what we have really focused on on the leadership level was talking about what pieces of it really have worked for Marion, what pieces of it have really driven those numbers for us to be able to succeed, and what does it make sense for us to be able to continue to do. Um, we looked at several different um, opportunities, including soliciting a proposal from Blue Zones for coming in and continuing to provide those services either directly through us as one community or as a consortium of communities that have participated in the project. In the project. Um, to give you an example just of the programs that are out there that are ones that we'd like to be able to continue, the community gardens over by the library raise a lot of food that gets donated to the Marion Food Pantry. The Sunrise Yoga out at um, Lau Park has been very well received and very well attended. Um, this would also provide for um, continued enrollments for new employers coming in that would like to participate, new restaurants, new workplaces that open, and continuing to coordinate uh, volunteer activities activities. Uh, also includes um, offering such items as cooking and nutrition, nutrition classes, so along with the fitness there's still education opportunities that um, would be presented. The proposal from Blue Zone gave Blue Zones themselves gave us a little bit of sticker shock because it was in the six figures area, um, fairly healthy for what we felt like we were going to continue to receive. And so we really at that point said, okay, what makes sense for us? Um, what partners have been at the table from the beginning of Blue Zones? Does it make sense to continue to invest in this? And it really came down to the city and the YMCA that both share a core mission of, of supporting a healthy environment for our community. Um, so we asked them to prepare a potential contract for services with them. Uh, the scope is outlined in the, in the um, 
proposed contract that you've seen in the council packet. There is one key component in there that um, at this point is not included. That would be the implementation of the active living plan. The council adopted the active living plan, but the next stage of that really is to start bringing the principles that it identifies into the way that we do business. So the principles that it talks about should start to show up in zoning codes. They should start to show up in, ro in road designs. They should start to show up in building designs and building reviews. Um, that's not included with this. This is just a continuation of current activities. So the proposal would be, we estimate that that's going to take around 15 hours a month just to continue to do that. Uh, the contract ends up being, um, if we had to pay for everything that was included as potential consumables, a little under $16,000 per year. Uh, we do have $20,000 budgeted for next year for the continuation of Blue Zone support and Blue Zone activities, so it's within budget. I uh, just wanted to see what questions the council had, if there's anything that you thought that we were missing in the scope of services. Um, I know many of you are, pr are aware that, uh, the, that Sarah Menser, who was the lead for Blue Zones in our community, um, actually works for the YMCA now, and she would be the one that would lead the project. Uh, the YMCA's contribution is about $5,000 worth of in-kind support for office supplies, consumables, office space, uh, telephone support, those types of activities that it takes to support the position. Questions? So it is budgeted that $1,100 a month, the fee for services. We have a $20,000 lump sum budget that we put in for next year for Blue Zone support. Thank you. Is that 1100 that does not include <coughs> the additional expenses that are at the end of the... No, the total of the, both of those together would be a maximum of 15950 Other questions? Okay. The next one uh, is related to the 151 and 13 development project. Uh, I wanted to run through this one in a bit more detail with the council because it's a, in many ways it's a very large project. I just wanted to bring you up to date on it with where we are. Um, the council would be asked to pass a resolution of intent to provide TIF assistance regarding the development and then at the uh, April 20th meeting we would start to move through the formal process for the adoption of the agreement. Uh, as you might remember, this is a 13-lot mixed-use project that has commercial space, retail space, restaurant, housing, and a planned hotel along with space for an event facility. Uh, it does have some unique issues related to the site. Um, stormwater management is one of them. Um, Off-site improvements are another. Uh, and then the development costs versus value. And the reason I wanted to have that picture up is to kind of show you what they encounter with this site. The area all there along the south is an existing drainage way, and a lot of that area um, is not developable due to its b being flood prone. And so if they were to pr pursue this as a conventional development where you just do a standalone stormwater detention basin, it actually chews up a lot of the property and you end up with um, less area that can actually be developed into something that produces taxes or jobs for the community. And so as part of the unique conditions of the site, you end up having to acquire all that area that you can't use to begin with and then you've got the challenge of dealing with stormwater as you build the area out. Um, so they've elected to put together a system much like Unity Point has done uh, and a few other isolated cases have done where you move the stormwater underground underneath your parking lots and actually <coughs> deal with it that way. Uh, the other thing that's unique about it and I think really points to something that I know we've debated at the staff level that I think some of us see as a flaw in the way that we approach subdivisions is that there's a considerable amount of off-site improvements that are needed. Um, this is really kind of the last area in that would be fully developed. There's some open space to the south on the other side of 151, but if you think about the other areas, you've got Walmart on the southeast corner, you have the Microtel and um, a lot of other businesses on the northwest corner, you've got Culver's and a lot of places that generate traffic. Because of the way DOT approaches development, they won't let you do anything until the area meets warrants. So it kind of sets it up so that the last person in 
has to pay for all of those offsite improvements. So this area being one that could drive a lot of traffic ends up potentially being the one that has to foot the bill for a traffic signal by Culver's, for a traffic signal down by 62nd Street, and then um, in the future, even improvements to the 15113 intersection with things like longer turn lanes and changes to traffic light timing. Um, even though they're not the one that's generating all of the demand for that, because of the way DOT approaches it, they end up being the ones that foot the bill for it. What that all does is it really puts this property upside down when it comes to development, because no matter how much it costs to develop it, it only has a market value. I mean, if you think of it in terms of you know what you might do to your house, you can go spend a half a million dollars on a 2,500 square foot house putting in all sorts of high-end executive finishes and everything in there. But at the end of the day, it's not worth the money that you put into it. You're not going to get it back out of the property. And that's really what you've got on this site is that the market value of the lots, once they're developed, is below the actual cost to develop the site. Um, if you talk to economists around Iowa that study these things, they'll call that a market failure, that you know the market can't support the cost to develop it. Um, if it could, this area probably would have developed a long time ago. So when they put in their original request for assistance to the city, um, they were asking for an 80% rebate for 15 years, a uh, forgivable loan to assist with the costs of moving the stormwater underground. Uh, the RISE grant is something that would be available through the DOT that the city um, has to act as a sponsor on. And then I'm showing tax credits in here, but those really are related to the multifamily project. Um, the city, m much like we've done with a couple of other projects, they're looking at workforce housing tax credits. The city has a $1,000 per unit match that needs to be contributed in order for them to be eligible for those. So we met with the development firm a couple of times and did an analysis of the uh, proposal and this is what the TIF team is recommending to the council is to do a 12-year rebate that steps down over that period of years uh, amounting to uh, $9.51 million. Uh, no forgivable loan component, um, certainly sponsoring the RISE grant and then providing the tax credit match that's needed for the workforce housing project. Um, there are a couple of unique things about this that um, I also wanted to bring out for council. Um, one of the things the developer would like to see is to have part of that $9.5 million be provided in the form of rebates from hotel motel tax. Um, because this is a multi-phase project, that $9.5 million, um, we're assuming that everything that they put together on their pro forma plays out exactly as it's planned. Um, but like I've brought up with the council several times, when you develop something, by the time property taxes come in off of it, there's a two-year gap. That's not the case with hotel motel. So if we provide 50% of the hotel motel rebates, it helps to bring that 9.5 million earlier. And that means that they pay less interest costs, which helps them out with the overall cost of the project. Um, because of the way the law is set up, you know, we want to make sure that there is an immediate community benefit and that we then use some of those dollars per the state code to provide dollars for tourism activities and things that actually generate hotel stays, so it's limited to 50% that can be rebated to the company. Um, the rebates in the development agreement would be tied to project phases, so that 12-year step-down schedule would apply to each phase as it was completed. So, you know, the first phase, six lots is slated to happen in the first year and a half. The other one might not happen until six years from now. The 12 years on the last phase would start in that year. So, you know, it would be potentially on the books in that scenario for 18 years before the project was completed. And then they're asking for the city to participate in offsite improvements. Um, they do plan to phase those. The RISE application would be looking at doing um, the two intersections first. Um, Culver's, the Culver's uh, intersection would be the first one that would need to be done. The second one would be over at 62nd Street. Um, the improvements or potential improvements to 151 and 13 would be several years on down the line and presumably would be a second RISE application. Um, this is the 50-50 program where RISE will pay up for up to 50% of the cost of those off-site improvements, um, but it's tied to eventual job creation that would occur across their entire subdivision. So overall, 
it breaks down that the city would be about 27% of the anticipated total investment on the site. Everything I've been talking about to date has just been related to the cost to develop the land, uh, but they're anticipating with the buildings, the hotels, uh, everything else that would go out there that it would be about a $35 million total investment. And this is where I wanted to, to walk through things with the council in a bit more detail. The net tax generated for the city over that period of time, over 15 years, is around $7.4 million. That's the net after the rebates. So that's the benefit to the taxing entities. If we, and this is why we always talk about that but for test, what happens if the city doesn't step in and provide the difference? Uh, over that same 15 years, if nothing happens on that site, it would generate about $522,000 in taxes. So by participating and providing an incentive, the net community benefit, city, county, schools, um, Kirkwood, is still more than $6.8 million. So very large project, very large, in, uh, very large incentive package. The break-even point for us on our investment is at about 17 years. And from that point forward, um, we've been fully repaid for anything that we provided as an incentive. And everything is a net benefit for the community from that point forward. So you're taking a site that right now uh, is paying a less than $50,000 a year in property taxes that at full build out is going to be paying about <coughs> $1.3 million. That's 17 years for um, 17 years for us to recoup 9.5 million. Does that take into account the different phases and the years that they say? Okay. Yep. It's a based off of um, what they put together in their pro forma for what they would anticipate for phases coming together. Now these numbers do vary a little bit. You know, if for some reason the taxable value comes in at less than 35 million, say it came in at 30 million, the rebates that they would receive would be less. Um, on the flip side, if the numbers come in higher, we'd cap it at the 9.5 million. So um, if <coughs> the assessed valuation is higher than expected, they could end up getting that number paid back to them in nine years. Do your numbers include any of the offsite support <coughs> with the uh, intersection? Yes. Okay. Yep. When a fa so when is the f so a phase doesn't start the the 15 years doesn't start in a phase till it's completely finished or till so like say there's five paths on a certain phase is it when they're all done the phase it would be broken down by phases so for example if the first phase is six lots and they all they're all done at the same time they'd all hit the tax rolls at the same time and they'd start receiving their rebates and then the clock starts ticking from when they start receiving rebates when the if phase is complete when the phases are complete okay. so if the third phase say ends up being 2019 taxes don't start coming in off of that until 2021 the 12-year clock starts ticking in 2021 I think at this point they anticipate the, that the multifamily residential would be the third phase and that I think they're looking at 2019 for that. I wanted to provide some more detail on these just knowing that, you know, what with these development projects, we're kind of getting into a stratosphere that uh, Marion hasn't been involved with on past projects. They're a lot more complex. They involve a lot more phases than what we have dealt with on past ones in, in bigger numbers. But uh, this one is more than twice the size of any projects that have been completed in Marion to date. Do we get copies of the slides on that? Those yeah, those slides? Uh, I actually put them in the council folders. So if you're... Uh, if your laptops are updating when you came in, you should be able to pick it up. I put a PDF of them in there. What's my council folder? Sorry. <laughs> your uh, iPad should sync to it when you come into the building. Hmm. I'll have James explain it. Okay. <laughs> Anymore? I'd add seasonal value in helping pay for those two intersections. 
Well, that's why they have the RISE program set up. I mean, if we're successful in sponsoring a RISE application for that, they will put 50% in. Um, they have two programs. One pays for 50% on what they call their competitive program, and then there's an 80% immediate opportunity. So, for example, if someone were appro to approach the development group on phase two and say, I'm going to bring 50 new jobs to the area, and we're going to pay you know, $25 an hour, and they were qualifying jobs, we could go in under the immediate opportunity program, which would pay 80% of the cost of those off-site improvements. It's just when you're doing a project like this, while they have a good idea of who they're targeting for those phases, um, you can't 100% guarantee that something like that would happen. But yeah, other than that, um, DOT, I think their philosophy is they provide the basics of the infrastructure system, and if you're generating additional demand on it, that it should be your responsibility to pay for those costs. <clears throat> would that be based on uh, jobs? I mean, could we use Limo Link as an example? Uh, they're too far down, wrong intersection. <laughs> <laughs> but when they go in for this type of an application, there are standards that DOT will look at. You know, on a typical, say, 20 acre commercial development, you would expect X number of jobs per acre, and that's what they'll take a look at when they're deciding how much assistance to provide or for eligibility. And there's some weird idiosyncrasies of the rules that we've run into on that before, but um, we're, uh, the Economic Alliance will be helping to write that on our behalf, and they have a lot of experience doing, working with that program. They would be obligated to charge the full hotel motel tax and get 50% of that figure back. They're not going to charge anything less than that to no, they're be unfair with competitive wise. Yeah, they're obligated to collect that. We did talk through that because there's some mechanics to doing that. We don't get a breakdown from the state when we receive our checks from the state on which facility is generating how much. So they'd have to share that information with us so we'd know how much they were submitting on a monthly or a quarterly basis so that we could uh, provide that 50% back. The big piece there is just to bring those, those TIF or the total incentive dollars in earlier and in larger numbers to cut the interest. You know, this is a rebate, so it's based on performance. They get a check once there's taxable value created, but they have to incur debt to put the roads in and do the projects and everything, and every minute that the clock is ticking is interest expense. Other questions on that one? Well, the next one I wanted to run through then with the council is Limo Link, which I'm assuming that everybody had a chance to see the announcement on that of what the company's plans are. Um, Limo Link's a company that's been in Marion since 1998, uh, enjoyed a lot of growth. Uh, they're currently in a leased facility of about 18,000 square feet, and they'd like to, uh, and they lease about another 10,000 square feet elsewhere, and they'd like to consolidate everything into one new headquarters building. Um, so they're planning on doing a facility that's between 30 and 35,000 square feet out at the Marion Enterprise. Price Center. Uh, it is a building that would meet the Tier 1 and Tier 2 design standards. Uh, the reason I point that out is because the design is a little bit flexible so that it could allow for a variety of future uses if they are really successful and build another building. Um, but it's one of the first ones that would be built towards the front of the park. Uh, the design allows for them to have the potential to add another 35,000 square feet in the future. Um, they're anticipating adding, I think, in the next three years, about 35 more positions over and above what they have right now. Um, this one project has a few unique characteristics in that in this point, in this project, we're actually competing with other communities that, are, that have looked at this project. And our TIF policy allows us to do a couple of different things. One is to look at um, the direct needs for the business, but then also to make sure that we're competitive with other communities and what they're putting on the table uh, to make sure that we don't miss an opportunity. And so um, in this case, the 
Uh, developer requested the equivalent of five years, 100% of rebate, which is comparable to what they're e eligible to receive around the areas. In some communities, um, they actually go set the equivalent of seven years, 100%. Um, there are some offsite improvements that they've asked for. Uh, curiously, in this case, they are related to quality of life issues. I know we've talked with the council many times about how businesses really do consider quality of life when they're trying to decide where to locate. Uh, in in this case, LimoLink has asked, made specific requests of the Medco Holding Company to make quality of life improvements for their employees. For example, um, there's a pond out there that they want to see them finish the walking trail around. They asked very specific questions about when this facility would be able to have a direct link to Waldo's Rock Park. Uh, additionally, uh, one of the things that attracted them to this site is proximity to the Marion Airport and the city's plans to make improvements to that facility. Uh, a good chunk of their business comes from booking private and charter jets, and uh, they want to be able to have people come in. Um, and the way it was phrased to me is that um, if a client is flying in and they're $20 million private plane, you want to have a facility that is going to be at the level that they expect. And so they're very much looking forward to being out uh, near the Marion Airport. So overall, the total package that on a five-year 100% rebate would be about $690,000. This is also the first project. Um, if you remember what we've done with LPLAST and Legacy, in most cases we've been able to provide that or the equivalent of that amount has been provided through the Medco Holding Company in discounted land price. Um, but those are their big buildings or they were buying a considerable amount of land at one time and so the land discount was equivalent to about five years 100 percent. In this case there's a lot of value being created on a smaller footprint so the uh, it's a two-phase economic incentive. One would be provided by the Medco Holding Company. Their land discount is, is estimated to be about $290,000 and then the rebate would be provided in steps uh, over 10 years would amount to about another $398,000 so that would put us at the equivalent of $688,000 so within about $2,000 of their request but rather than a five-year 100 percent this is 10 years starts at 90 goes down 10% a year with the last two years being at 10% each. But this is really the first time we've done a project out at the MEC where the land discount um, was not high enough to be considered the equivalent of, of five years 100%. Um, on a high value building where you've got a high dollar per square foot on construction costs, that can happen. So overall, on this one, uh, here's the breakdown. It's anticipated to be about a $7 million project. Uh, the building itself is about five point, building and site work is about 5.3 million of that. Overall city investment, we're a little under 10%, 9.8% of the total anticipated cost. I've been conservative on the expectations for future value, just trying to look at the construction cost and then um, what the likely assessment on the facility would be afterwards. So even with that, looking at that same 15-year window that we did for the 15113 project, um, the net new taxes generated uh, is about 773,000. The site out there right now, as it sits, pays about $550 a year in property taxes. So over that period of time, the net community benefit is still uh, 767,000. And that's netting out the rebates. Questions? I thought it was really interesting that, uh, Mike, they brought in the park and as part of their requirement and the quality of life of their employees. And I, I thought that was pretty neat, you know. It's great to see them bring that forward and preaching that for years, so. Just a, just a comment. I think it's important to also note, and Lon uh, discussed it, the what happens when you go vertical on the value of the ground. And so, I mean, you've, that's something that we talk, we're talking about <coughs> out here in the business park, but think of that in our uptown area. When you start to go vertical, the footprint and the value, is, it's, it's so much more, it's just much greater. <coughs> so when you hear about 
projects that are going two and three levels up with housing, like the library. I mean, that is certainly an, uh, something we want to try to encourage the density, but density done right is very important too. But uh, the value that it creates is, right. is tremendous. And here's a situation that shows that, I think, specifically. So. Uh, number five is a motion. A, I think we have a question. Right, there, okay. is a, there is a TIF on this, right? On limo lane? On the limo lane. That's what we're proposing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I Today I'm not good on numbers. Uh, what For what period of time? 15 years? On limo link, we're proposing to do it for 10. I'm sorry, 10? On ten for 10. Um, first year would be 90%, uh, second year 80, 70, 60, 50, until you get to years 9 and 10, and the last two years are at 10%. Okay, all right. And the percentage of the TIF would be? We're about 9.8% of the overall okay. project. All right. Got to put these things down. We'll give you printed copies of them merely. Okay, I appreciate that. Yep. Words of one syllable, please. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot guarantee that. <laughs> Uh, and number five is a motion to receive and file and refer to the TIF team for review a request for TIF assistance from uh, KTRO Incorporated. This is for a project down on 3rd Avenue. Uh, at this point, there's no recommended action, but uh, it being consistent with what we've done for past practice for things like TAC, uh, we want to start um, having the council receive and file these and then refer them over to the TIF team for further action. So that's what we'll be doing on Thursday. Um, it'll go through the normal review process and then come back to council for recommendation. Uh, then number six is a motion to receive and file a request uh, to designate the Historical Society as the caretaker and repository of the City of Marion's artifacts. As we move towards storing a lot of our documents and everything electronically, there's a ton of stuff that we have here that has a lot of historical value for the community. Um, it's probably better served by being in a place where they actually know and are good at storing uh, historic documents and fragile older things than we are here. Um, we have lost some after we had a little flooding incident in the basement. We'd really like to minimize the opportunities for that. Um, Mr. Kloppenstein has brought forward a request for that for the city to designate them as the official entity that would handle that on our behalf. And so with the approval of the council, we'd have a resolution on Thursday to name them as our depository for those types of things. And we, I think, would basically give them the pick of the litter as we were um, moving stuff out of City Hall for what they wanted to keep. So they would get to choose what they want to... Yeah, for example, you know, when you go down to the basement, we might have five copies of the same map. They might elect to save the three nicest ones or something like that rather than try to preserve all five. And the uh, information that uh, the city is required to keep forever you would have electronic copies of those prior yeah, to? Yeah, some of the things like city council minutes and things like that, I, those I think will always stay with City Hall. But there are documents downstairs, things that we are not necessarily required to keep. Some of it we have to keep for 75 years, and then after 75 years we can move it out. Uh, it's just the realities of storage that there's just too much for us to have space to keep everything. Um, we've been working for years on moving items over to historic or over to electronic storage, and we're continuing to work on that. And they are equipped to handle handle all these items. They have a pretty good idea of what we have on hand and how much volume it takes. I think. Okay. Yes. Did you want to do it? Yeah, if you'd like to. Oh my questions. I don't. I don't think you should let him talk. Rick Clapton, scene 5540 Hunters Ridge. I am president of the Historical Society. We just recently got uh, all the old Marion Sentinels from the library, and then the racks to store them. So that's part of the historical part of the community. We have a lot of uh, railroad artifacts, 
of the community as well. So I'm sorry I don't have any big numbers up there <laughs> to give you, but our budget's somewhere around 30,000. I thought I had a request in here for some money, but I must not have. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody assumed that. Motel, motel. Maybe Hard that will be forthcoming. So, <laughs> uh, Hard to believe. I sure appreciate your approval of this. Do you have any questions? Oh, thank you. Would you store Eric stuff at, at the Heritage Center? Yes. And that would be Eric Miles is also the lobby there. member of the board. Thank you. Thanks for providing the opportunity. And I didn't have anything else starred, but just did just want to uh, draw the council's attention to uh, item number 11, which is the ordinance that actually creates the uh, permanent airport commission. Um, this is based on the recommendations of the airport advisory committee and takes their um, recommendations, moves them into ordinance form. And so once the council would adopt this, uh, then we'd move forward with getting that group constituted and up and running. Uh, if there's no objections at the We'd pass the first reading on Thursday night, assume that the second and third would be done on April 20th, and then I, uh, with the mayor's indulgence, if he was ready, we could appoint, start appointing members that night. Your Honor, I would like to, uh, the, uh, uh, the draft of the agreement from uh, Mr. Supel about the uh, parking, uh, the address on that is in error. Uh, because I couldn't find 7060 12th Avenue anywhere. <laughs> so uh, that is 760 12th Avenue. I think one too many zeros. Okay. Also, I have another question. How much property minus actual city facilities, how much property does the city own that is not taxed? How many acres do we have in parks and open space, Mike? 600. Okay, well, what I'm thinking about is the residential areas, well, like between 14th and 15th Street, 5th I think, Avenue, I think she means non-park non property. Yeah, I, and I, is there some way I could get a listing of all the, minus the parks, and trail, no, no parks and trails, but other. Right, yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, the easiest thing, we have to name all of our properties. I'll see what uh, we provide to ICAP, our insurance provider, but we have to give them a listing of all of our properties for everything that we itemize out so that we've got coverage. But I'll see if we can pull that. But from if there. the city owns it, it's not taxed, right? Depends. If we lease it to a for profit entity, then well, it yeah. is taxable. Then so, like is. the Digert Peck building, the McGowan House are taxable. If you lease it to a nonprofit, then you have to petition the county, and then the county, if it's a 501c3 charitable purpose nonprofit, they typically will allow that to be non-taxable. I think it's important to know how much, if we're going to keep it or not. We, we buy some property that we have to to move forward, but some of that we're not planning on keeping. Yeah, and that's one of the things that will be identified with the update to the central corridor plan. Uh, as they give us recommendations for the mix of uses and what types of things will uh, be appropriate for different locations, uh, as part of that, we'll be setting those up so that we can do requests for proposals on sites for surplus property up and down the corridor, the pieces that uh, we don't intend to hold or own long term. But if there's no other questions under administration, that's all I've got. Oh my God. Okay. On the appointments, I, I still haven't been able to get a hold of Grant Geyer. Okay. Can you try? Okay. All right. Any other questions on any part of the agenda that wasn't discussed? Okay. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you.